If you go to the Bibliotheca Albertina, the library of the University of Leipzig in Germany, you can see the Ebers Papyrus, one of the oldest medical manuscripts known to mankind, dating back to 1500 BC, and probably a copy of a still older document. This Egyptian text, 3,500 years old, outlines therapies for various maladies known to the ancients. Yellow ochre for intestinal and eye complaints, the procedure for removing guinea worms, a procedure still used today, and herbs for asthma. One of the treatments listed is a mixture of dates, beer leaves, cucumber flowers, and milk, administered for polyuria, or excessive urination. Excessive urination, polyuria, was noted by many ancient medical scholars, from Apollonius of Memphis to Galen to Eretaeus. Apollonius called it the disease of passing through, or siphoning, or in Greek, diabetes. Ancient physicians also noted that in most cases the urine was sweet, which is one of the many reasons I'm glad I'm a 21st century physician rather than an ancient Greek doctor. And so the suffix mellitus, meaning honeyed, sweet, or pleasant, was eventually added to the name of the disease we know today as diabetes mellitus. Of course, there's not a damn thing sweet or pleasant about it, aside from the urine. Diabetes is a scourge of mankind, more so than ever. And the worst thing about it is that many cases are preventable. Today, in the first of our series on this monster, we're going to talk about the basics of diabetes. What it is, how it happens, how it contributes to a whole host of other health problems, and why it seems to be getting worse. Let's get to know our enemy. Hi, I'm Jonathan Sullivan, and welcome back to Graysteel. Diabetes mellitus currently afflicts almost a half billion people around the world, and its incidence seems to be increasing, primarily due to the type 2 or so-called adult onset form of the disease, which comprises about 90% of cases worldwide. Diabetes and its related afflictions kill millions around the world every year, with billions of dollars of healthcare costs and lost productivity in the U.S. alone. It's a human catastrophe. But what is it exactly? To understand diabetes, we need to understand how we use carbohydrate, basically sugars and starches, as fuel. Carbohydrate is used by virtually every cell in our body, primarily in the form of glucose. Even when you eat other types of sugars, like sucrose or fructose or maltose, they get converted into glucose for use by the cell. Glucose can be stored as animal starch, or glycogen, in the liver and muscles. And of course, there's always some glucose circulating in the bloodstream for ready use. The amount of glucose in the blood is never more than about 3 or 4 grams, or about the equivalent of a sugar cube. When blood sugar drops, hormones like epinephrine and glucagon cause the release of glucose from the liver into the bloodstream to feed your hungry cells. But your cells can't use this glucose sugar until it actually gets into the cell, across the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is not permeable to glucose. To get into the cell, the glucose needs to enter through specific channels, or glucose transporters. And that's where insulin comes in. When blood glucose rises, like say after a meal, the hormone insulin is released by the pancreas and circulates in the bloodstream. Insulin binds to specific insulin receptors on the membrane of the cell, like a key fitting into a lock. The binding to the insulin receptor triggers a cascade of signaling events inside the cell, culminating in the translocation of glucose transporters to the cell membrane. These transporters allow glucose to enter the cell, where it can be stored as glycogen, or converted to fat, split anaerobically for rapid energy, or oxidized in the mitochondria for energy. Diabetes is what happens when this insulin signaling system becomes deranged and dysfunctional. In type 1, or so-called juvenile onset diabetes, the problem is the pancreas. A genetic predisposition, probably coupled to an environmental trigger such as a viral infection, results in the destruction of the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. No insulin, no insulin signaling. Blood sugar rises, 
and you have diabetes. This requires lifelong treatment with insulin. Our focus today is on type 2, or so-called adult onset diabetes, which is more prevalent, more preventable, and more complicated. In type 2 diabetes, the derangement in insulin signaling is not so much from a lack of insulin, although a relative lack of insulin will eventually play a role as the disease progresses. Instead, the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes begins with a resistance to insulin signaling at the cellular level. Insulin is still produced by the beta cells of the pancreas, but the ability of the cells to respond to insulin is blunted at several levels, including the number and responsiveness of insulin receptors, the ability of the insulin receptor to trigger the signaling cascade, and the availability of glucose transporters and their ability to translocate to the cell membrane and allow glucose to pass. So insulin resistance is complex and it arises from multiple causes acting together in complex ways. These causes include genetic, environmental, and lifestyle causes, including diet, sleep, stress, and obesity. We'll talk more about these factors later. Once insulin resistance is established, it has a terrible and tremendous impact on our physiology. The details are not completely worked out, but we can simplify this complex process for our purposes. Insulin resistance means a decrease in the ability of all tissues, but particularly muscle, liver, and fat to respond appropriately to any given level of insulin with glucose uptake and other critical insulin-triggered functions. Now, this would lead to a rise in blood sugar, except that, at first, this challenge is met by the beta cells of the pancreas, which release more insulin to cover the lack in sensitivity. They work harder, and they may even proliferate or get larger at first. The resistance of muscle tissue is a big hit because muscle is the major sink for glucose uptake, and a lack of muscle insulin sensitivity will contribute strongly to elevated blood sugar levels. The liver's insulin resistance means that this organ, which is critical for glucose metabolism, thinks you're hungry. The lack of insulin signaling in the liver causes it to release sugar from the glycogen into the bloodstream and make sugar from non-carbohydrate carbon skeletons derived from pyruvate, lactate, fatty acids, and proteins. So even though your blood sugar is normal or even a little high, your liver is acting like you're starving, increasing the amount of glucose in your blood. The overworked beta cells can hardly keep up, but it gets worse. The fat tissue is also resistant to insulin signaling, so it also thinks you're hungry, and it responds by releasing fatty acids into the bloodstream. These fatty acids can be used by the liver to produce more glucose to overload the beta cells and drive them further toward exhaustion. The insulin-resistant fat becomes an abnormal endocrine organ, too, releasing inflammatory signaling molecules called cytokines, or adipokines, into the circulation, which promote the development of cell damage, arterial disease, oxidative stress, and other badness. This behavior of the fat in insulin resistance leads to a state called lipotoxicity, literally poisoning in your own fat. And some investigators think it's the last straw for those overworked beta cells in the pancreas. Whether it's lipotoxicity, programmed cell death, or some other process, the result is the same. Eventually, the beta cells start to give out and die, and the pancreas can no longer overproduce insulin to cover the pre-diabetic lack of insulin signaling. Dead beta cells can no longer make up for insulin resistance. Insulin production drops. So by this point, it's gone way beyond insulin resistance. Now, it's diabetes. It's type 2 diabetes, with all the signs and symptoms that go with it including our old friend, polyuria. This results from an osmotic effect of the high blood glucose on the kidney. Polyuria goes hand in hand with polydipsia, or increased thirst. And the inappropriate response of liver, muscle, fat, and brain to the lack of insulin signaling gives you polyphagia, or hunger. Fatigue, dizziness, frequent infections, muscle wasting, neuropathy, and eventually vascular disease, like cardiovascular disease, will ensue. I want to stress again that all of the foregoing is simplified. It's important to point out that this pathophysiology doesn't always progress in the same way. 
Some people have insulin resistance, which is bad enough, but don't suffer beta cell failure and progress to full diabetes. And even in type 2 diabetes, there's generally some residual insulin secretion. It's just woefully inadequate. In some individuals, the diabetic phenotype is primarily due to insulin resistance, and in some, the relative lack of insulin itself. The lab will find an elevated serum glucose, or hyperglycemia, elevated serum fat, or triglycerides, and an elevated level of glycated hemoglobin, or HbA1c. A1c is simply hemoglobin that is marinated in sugary blood too long and now has a glucose residue stuck to it. In the barbell prescription, I speculated that HbA1c might be more than a marker of diabetes, but actually contribute to damage. A recent paper by Saleh suggests this might indeed be the case, citing recent data and putative mechanisms by which elevated hemoglobin A1c might contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Whatever the underlying mechanisms, the consequences are clear. Diabetes is such a profound arrangement of metabolism that virtually every tissue and every organ system in the body is adversely affected. Diabetes increases the risk of high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, stroke, neuropathy, infection, amputation, impotence, visual impairment, and blindness, kidney failure, and premature death. So, all of this is a catastrophe. The increasing prevalence of type 2 diabetes, even in children, suggests strongly that this disease is a byproduct of our modern, overfed, sedentary, urbanized world. But it also means that it is, at least to some considerable degree, preventable. Again, genetic and environmental causes are hard to impact, but diet, exercise, and other lifestyle factors give us a lot of power to modify our risk for this awful disease. We're going to talk a lot about that, particularly exercise, in part three of this series. But first, in part two, we're going to talk about modern pharmacotherapeutic approaches to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. That's because, whether we like it or not, for some of us, the horse is already out of the barn, and we have to live with anti-diabetic medicines. But as we'll see in our next installment, this does not mean we can't be athletes of aging. So I do hope you'll join us then. Thanks for watching this episode of Gray Steel. Remember, our content is for educational and infotainment purposes only and does not constitute advice for any particular person, patient, disease, or condition. If you have questions about your health, you should work closely with your physician.